Well, hello and welcome to our webinar, Waste Management at the Processing Plant. I'm Catherine Kwanbeck, the Program Manager for the Niche Meat Processor Assistance Network, and I'm based at Oregon State University. And I am your host today. We're using WebEx, which we're fairly new to, so if one of our participants could type into the chat box that they hear me, that would be great. And I'll go on telling you a little bit more about NIMPAN. So NIMPAN, we do webinars on topics related to small-scale meat processing and the farmers and ranchers who raise meat for local and other niche markets. If you'd like to be on our email list, please sign up at our website, which is nichemeatprocessing.org. Oh, good. The audio is good. If you have webinar topic suggestions, please email me, and I'll go ahead and type our website and my address into the chat box here in a second. NIMPAN is a network of processors, farmers and ranchers, universities, public agencies, nonprofit groups, and others. Our mission is to support small and very small meat processors who are essential partners in bringing local and sustainable meat and poultry to market. NIMPAN is also part of Extension, an initiative of the National Land Grant University System. So three things before we get started today. There'll be plenty of time for questions, both during and after the presentation. And to ask the question, please type it into the chat box on the right-hand side of the screen, which many of you have already found. The webinar is being recorded, and we're going to post it later on the NIMPAN website and our YouTube channel along with the presentation slides. And we have a full agenda today, and we're going to get to as many questions as possible. If your question doesn't get answered, please email me after the webinar, and I'll try and get it answered. All right, our agenda for today. So today's webinar is Waste Management at the Processing Plant. And managing, treating, and removing solid waste and wastewater often comes at a significant cost for small-scale meat processing facilities. For those new to meat processing or those looking for new ideas for their plant, this webinar is going to provide a general overview on waste management for both solid waste and wastewater. We're going to discuss wastewater management, basic systems and pretreatment options, and some of the regulations. We'll also cover solid waste streams, things like manure, bones, trim, potch material, et cetera, and solutions we're dealing with those various waste streams. Our speakers today are Tommy Bass of Montana State University Extension. Brian Keeper of the University of Georgia, and Jean Bontel of Cornell Waste Management Institute. We'll take one or two questions after each talk, and then we'll save the rest for the end. I'm going to go ahead and get Tommy started here. Our first speaker today is Thomas Bass. Tommy is an Associate Extension Specialist in Montana, dealing with environmental management of livestock production and processing, as well as management of other ag and food residuals. He's also currently pursuing his doctorate part-time, studying spatial and temporal dynamics of Montana's local beef supply chain. Tommy has worked in ag and food environmental management since 2001 at both the University of Georgia and Montana State University. Tommy, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to you, and we can get started. All right. Thanks so much. I will bump forward. There's my intro. Um, good morning or good afternoon, everybody, uh, depending what side of the divide you're visiting from today. Um, I'm going to give just a little bit of background about why we're concerned with these waste streams um, that are inevitable or just a part of um, our industry. So with wastewater, um, quite a few reasons why <clears throat> we'd be concerned uh, with dealing with wastewater properly. Uh, we know it has to go somewhere, and when it enters our environment, uh, wastewater, that is, uh, it could pose um, a hazard to drinking water and human health or public health, whether that be uh, via contamination of groundwater supplies or uh, surface water. Um, even within our own um, greater industry, that you know, agricultural and food industry, um, the number one top nutrient for producing healthy animals is water. So. Um, we want to deal with wastewater prop properly so that we can continue to have high-quality livestock and poultry production, which is reliant on a healthy water source. Um, generally, as you see on the slides, I say environmental quality and community health. So, you know, this is, is going beyond, say, the drinking water aspect, and we think about um, <clears throat> all the different uses or the importance of, of clean water, whether it's uh, to support uh, a fishery, whether commercial or recreational, um, whether it's for recreational use of water um, for the human population, 
And then, you know, clean water can impact um, crop agriculture as well as previously mentioned animal agriculture, et cetera. So um, once again, dealing with wastewater properly is to, you know, protect our entire um, social and, and environmental ecology. Um, additionally, other industries and sectors um, need clean water. Um, so, you know, it's an economic detriment to a community if there are not clean water sources available for other um, productive uses. And then finally, when a community or even an individual has to um, treat water, say, to make it suitable for municipal drinking water or uh, personal drinking water, um, there's an economic cost there um, to overcome that health threat. So just some of the basics of, of why it's important to deal with any sort of wastewater properly. Pardon the pause. I'm having a little trouble advancing. There we go. So if we talk about uh, wastewater in the context of um, meat processing and uh, other food processing as well, what are the potential pollutants? And I say potential because um, these things are pollutants when they're in the wrong concentration or in the wrong place at the wrong time. So dealing with different treatment scenarios and then when, where, and how um, we reintroduce those waters to the environment uh, really determines whether it's pollution or not. So first and foremost here I have listed uh, biochemical or biological oxygen demand. And this is really, um, really a measure of the amount of organic matter in the wastewater, and um, the oxygen demand component is basically how much oxygen will be removed from the water when these organic materials, the food waste in the wastewater, um, is broken down aerobically um, by microorganisms. Um, and the big picture of this is, um, say, for example, from a nutrient and fertilizer and aquatic plant growth perspective is the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico um, when organic matter decays, oxygen is uh, pulled out of the water that, that otherwise would have made it a healthy water and supported um, organisms. So that's the whole deal with BOD. Um, and then it's, it's quite, um, can be expensive to deal with at a treatment plant. Dissolved and suspended solids, so just other materials that are inherent to or, or uh, mixed in with the wastewater um, nutrients. And I have uh, flagged nitrogen and phosphorus primarily. Um, once again, they are beneficial to, they're essential nutrients for plants, animals, humans, but uh, at the wrong place at the wrong time and in our water sources, they can also be pollutants. Bats, oils, and grease, um, pretty straightforward. Chlorine, um, adulterants, and reaction products. So these really are things that are introduced to the wastewater in uh, meat and food processing that usually are part of cleaning or sanitation. Um, and they can be problematic once they are back in the environment. Um, reaction products, uh, those are things that might not initially be in the wastewater, but it's the result of, say, um, a potential uh, cleaner or disinfectant reacting with, with something biological, and then um, a, another product results from that reaction. So. That's what the reaction products are. They're not necessarily um, something that was initially introduced to the wastewater, but something that was produced within the wastewater. And these are just some of the common processes um, throughout um, meat and food processing where we would start to mix um, waste products, byproducts in with the initial clean water source. So all sorts of washing, cleaning, and sanitation, whether that be equipment, surfaces um, or washing and rinsing of raw materials and carcass wash down, et cetera. Um, slaughter and bleeding, I will mention that uh, back to that biological oxygen demand that um, what we do with blood is quite important because that is, um, of all the potential waste streams, that's one of the strongest in BOD coming from meat processing. Cooking and cooling uh, waters, and then uh, finally, not just what's going on inside, um, the kill area or for the processing area, but also out in the parking lot, pens, and loading, unloading areas. There's going to be wastewater generated there. And we'll get into a little more detail in a bit about specific options and 
but we're already starting to see here maybe to think forward some opportunities to separate waste streams um, and deal with each one um, a little more individually and, and efficiently. A couple of the basics of wastewater treatment, we might hear about a couple of these in more detail um, shortly. Um, for many small plants, connecting to a publicly owned treatment work or the local wastewater treatment plant is a viable option. Um, this image here is Bozeman, Montana's new uh, municipal wastewater treatment plant, or at least one small portion of it. And I would say that up until recently, they were really at or beyond capacity for even the residential um, demand on that plant, and they would have had no capacity to say take on the waste stream from even a small meat processing plant. Um, recently renovated and expanded and, and they're in better shape, but this starts to introduce some of the concerns on how these decisions are made. Um, the public water treatment utility may not be able to take on the waste um, from even a small meat processing plant, or if they can, some pretreatment might be required. We know that on-site septic is quite common, um, small and on the smaller end of uh, meat and food processing plants, um, sometimes once again with separate wastewater streams into different uh, different tanks or series of tanks, but on-site septic is pretty common. Um, as we start to get a little bit larger, we might see plants with ponds or lagoons that um, these can be engineered structures that would anaerobically treat the waste um, and quite often um, that material, the, the top water at least, would be land applied. Um, sludge might have to be dealt with on some interval, three to six years uh, sometimes. Once again, this might be part of a whole system, including pretreatment. And there might be some new, more progressive or um, cost-effective on-site alternatives, um, discharging waste into constructed wetlands, um, vegetated treatment areas uh, are sort of similar. and. You know, there may be others that, that some of our attendees are even familiar with that have worked and passed regulatory muster. Solid waste, Catherine mentioned, you know, these common wastes in the, in the intro. Um, we can see the list here as, as well as I can. We recognize that um, with some of these wastes, there, there are also um, opportunities for either some cost recovery or an actual product, but that's probably going to require additional uh, human resources and further processing, you know, uh, such as hides. If, uh, if you don't have someone immediately to take them, um, it might require that you at the plant level have to um, do some pretreatment before they can be shipped to a market. Um, there's an opportunity, but there's also a cost associated with it, um, depending on your situation. Um, Bones, you know, sometimes uh, there's an opportunity there uh, into another industry or pet treats and whatnot. Um, but once again, for many plants, the reality is it's just something they have to deal with on their own. Um, at any rate, um, the second half of the webinar here today will probably do some focusing on um, the composting aspect, rec recognizing that that is something that you can have control over on site especially in light of reduced opportunities for rendering, which would deal with many of these solid wastes. Um, finally, just some addition to that list, damaged or rejected product. And then this is just, you know, a, a meat plant is also a regular business, so there's going to be a lot of other uh, waste that has to be dealt with that might not be production and processing oriented, um, or there might be other solid wastes that um, are not compostable, are not renderable, are not opportunities for further products that um, just end up in the dumpster. So um, at any rate, these are all the things we want to comprehensively consider um, in managing a plant well, opening a new plant, um, just what all these waste streams could be. As far as regulatory authority, um, this is a national audience and the archive webinar will be available nationally, so we can't go into too much detail on regulations, but we should sort of recognize um, for, for a plant operator where they may be going or what they may consider um, when they need to get um, an idea about regulations. It's really sort of uh, an umbrella type of scheme. So the, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency 
this pretty broad regulatory authority, particularly in the water area, and that comes from the Clean Water Act. Um, however, um, for a small business working in a community and, and within a state, they're most likely first going to interact with um, a state agency. And most state environmental agencies um, sort of manage and implement the Clean Water Act on behalf of EPA. So it takes that federal overarching rule and then brings it under lo more local management at the state level. Um, so that's where a lot of your general waste uh, wastewater management statutes, rules, and regulations are really going to come from. It's going to come from that state um, state authority, and they're acting on behalf of EPA, and they may have more stringent state rules as well. Um, so particularly in the wastewater management side of things, you're going to see these um, state or de facto level federal rules um, perhaps impacting the decisions you make on wastewater management. But the person you will probably interact with most on both wastewater and solid waste is going to be um, your county sanitarian, your local water authority, um, and perhaps local public health. And depending on the state and the county, um, those types of offices have different sorts of relationships with each other at the county level. But basically, your most local contact and oversight is going to come from um, that type of um, person and um, respective department at the very local level. So with that, um, I'm going to pass it on. Catherine uh, is going to introduce uh, Dr. Keeper. Thank you. Okay. Great. And actually, before we move on to Brian's presentation, um, we have a, a question here, Tommy, for you. Oh, great. So I'm not seeing those in my chat, so please. Oh, okay. Um, Some of them get sent just to me, so I, I can always read them out loud, too. Um, thank you. How does a state CAFO, a combined animal feedlot permit, relate to federal waste management um, in terms of, you know, the degree of integration um, and who's the priority of authority, basically who's in charge. Is that one that's kind of a quick one or should we save that for the end? No, it's it's quick and it's perfect uh, for the example I gave where we have um, in the Clean Water Act, we have the, the CAFO provisions um, mm -hmm. and that's that's federal. However, almost every state in the United States has a state agency with delegated authority to um, to manage that that discharge permit for a CAFO, and basically, um, it says that um, in the event of a 25-year, 24-hour storm, um, the animal feeding operation is essentially allowed to lose control of their their waste management from a water perspective, um, and and that permit is says that's okay under those extenuating circumstances. Otherwise, they have to have a whole um, manure nutrient and fertilizer nutrient management plan and um, all of those things. So um, in almost every state in the United States, a state agency manages that. And then many states might have different permit levels for smaller operations below um, what we call the CAFO threshold, which can mm -hmm. be different the from multiple APHOS. species. Yeah, mm -hmm. the CAFOs and APHOs. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, uh, so anyway, there's definitely some similarities there. Mm -hmm. There are, and you'll see the similarities uh, related to nutrient management plans. If it's a meat processing plant with lagoons um, and waste ponds or slurry ponds, you're going to see um, similar recommended best management practices on dealing with those materials. And there may even be a similar or companion permit at the state level related mm -hmm. to that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. All right. Well, thank you, Tommy. That was really helpful in setting the stage and helping us understand the general overview of what, you know, what we're talking about when we talk about wastewater management and solid waste management. And now we're going to dive into wastewater in particular, and Dr. Brian Keeper is going to help us out with that. Dr. Keeper is an Associate Professor and Extension Specialist of Poultry Processing and Environmental Management, and he's in the Department of Poultry Science at the University of Georgia. The state of Georgia currently grows almost 1.5 billion broiler chickens every year and processes those birds in 20 processing plants. And those plants must average more than 250,000 birds per day to meet that demand. So 
Uh, Dr. Keeper is very familiar with wastewater management at a processing scale from um, visiting, I'm sure, many of those plants. Brian, it looks like you've got control of the slides, so I'm going to let you take it from here. Thank you very much for the uh, introduction and uh, appreciate the opportunity to, to be on the webinar today. So when we concentrate on wastewater treatment, um, regardless of the size, the first thing that we need to establish is whether our facility is going to be, is or is going to be an indirect discharger or a direct discharger. So in the case of an indirect discharger, we hear this term that we're going to hear a lot, which is this idea of pretreatment. And in a case like that, if we take a processing plant, and hopefully you can see my laser pointer on there, we're going to use in an example a, a, a processing plant that would typically generate something in the neighborhood of 2,500 milligrams per liter as a concentration for BOD, as Tommy mentioned, BOD, and that, that plays in well to my slides. Um, what we would do in a pretreatment situation is we would take on the responsibility, that plant, to basically treat or pretreat that water down a log reduction to something that is acceptable, a level that's acceptable to the POTW, the local wastewater treatment facility. And in that case, they would take ownership of that water and then treat again down another log reduction to a level that would be acceptable for putting into the environment. And in a case like this, this, this spot here, this, this spot between the pretreatment at the facility and the POTW would be the place where the effluent from the processing plant would be permitted, as Tommy mentioned, very, very often by the local municipality uh, the, the system that where you're directly discharging to would take on that responsibility of issuing you a permit allowing you the discharge limits for going into their system. On the other hand, you also have the option or some places have the option of doing full treatment. That is, you take on the full responsibility of taking, uh, using your process water and then treating it fully, taking in this case two log reductions and giving you the opportunity then to directly discharge into the environment. As you can imagine, this is in some cases a tougher permit to get, and in, in most every case, well, yes, would be every case, much more stringent limits than you would see in a pretreatment situation. This would be, again, one that you would either take your effluent to a land application system or um, to a direct water discharge. And in this case, um, many, off, uh, many times, it would be the state at the state level that you would have a, a direct discharge permit. So that's the first step we need to determine when you are uh, in a meat processing, um, processing wastewater treatment situation. Now when you see these permits, and, and this is something I deal with quite a lot with clients, is there's a laundry list of parameters that these permits will cover and often can be pretty intimidating to look at, um, you know, three, four, sometimes up to ten or even a dozen permit parameters that you have to meet. And one of the things I like to do is make sure that people understand that, that all these parameters basically fall into a few basic categories that Tommy talked about briefly and I just want to highlight. So the first uh, area of interest that all people interested in wastewater treatment is this idea of overall organic strength. And so any time that we see parameters like uh, biochemical oxygen demand, BOD, or COD, or in a special case of an organic strength, uh, uh, oil and grease, those all fit into this category of giving the treatment operators an idea of the strength of the water coming to them from an organic standpoint. The second is the particulates or solids. We need to know what form those, that organic strength and other materials are coming to us um, are they in large solid pieces? Are they in fine solids? And so anytime you see something along the lines of total suspended solids, total solids, total dissolved solids, we can even throw in total volatile solids and a lot of others, they all fit into this category of letting that treatment operator's operation know what is the form the pollutants are coming to them. The third category is nutrients. Again, highlighting like Tommy did, uh, nitrogen and phosphorus, you see things like total Kendall nitrogen or ammonia nitrogen, total phosphorus, all of those fit into that category of a nutrient that, again, absolutely essential for the life of plant and animals on this planet, 
but in the wrong concentrations in the wrong places can really be a problem. And then finally, we're going to see really based on the specific operation of our facilities that we're uh, coming from or the treatment facilities we're going to, different physical property measurements when, they wanna, when they're want to when they concerned about how much flow or the pH of your water or dissolved oxygen, temperature, chlorine levels. Um, and so hopefully that will give a little insight into the basic categories that we see in that parameters and those long list on our permits won't be near as intimidating as they have been in the past. So when we talk about actually physically treating our water, doesn't matter whether we're doing 2,000 or 2 million gallons of water a day, the treatment philosophy is still the same. I'd be remiss being an extension specialist in this field if we didn't first talk about using every, um, every effort that we can, can to eliminate pollution to begin with, which is really in that realm of pollution prevention. But once we do have that process water, we tend to attack it in what we call in an industrial or commercial setting as physical treatment, chemical treatment, and ultimately, if needed, biological treatment. So just quickly a word about pollution prevention. I put a quote up here I say all the time. If you don't let it, being pollution, enter the waste stream in the first place, you don't ever have to take it back out. And so we're always going to want to emphasize, regardless of the size of our facility, um, anything we can do to prevent pollution in the first place. I give an example here of emphasizing dry cleaning techniques. Now, you know, I use a picture here very specifically. We use this, I use this picture often as an example of, of sort of a no-no, and that is this idea of using a broom, uh, water as a broom. We, we tend to move a lot of material around our processing plants using water because it's easy to use, it's high pressure, it's hot, and does a great job. But in this photo specifically, you can see there's a lot of material on the floor there that's in a solid waste form, that if we would take the time to physically use a broom um, and, and some sort of a pan or shovel to pick it up, it would never enter our stream in the first place. And some people may say, well, you know, you can see in this example, maybe they're just using that to gather that material. But we've got to remember, hot water under pressure is going to extract all sort of pollutants, even if at a later time we, we pick this material up. So we want to use anything we can do to mo every pound of material we can move physically without using water is going to help us on the wastewater treatment side. And it's also important to keep in mind as pollutants move further down the waste train, as we'll talk about, we do a great job in our industries, uh, in our industry of meat processing, removing these materials. But every step of the way that we remove them, we start to lose value as we change those solids more and more from what are really just raw product that we dealt with into the sludges and things that we'll see that are a result of biological treatment. So after maximizing pollution prevention, the first step in the treatment of meat processing wastewater is literally maximizing the physical separation of pollutants. We're going to do every single thing we can to get material out in the form that it went into the water in, okay? That's the goal. And traditionally in the poultry processing industry, we've done that with screens, and we'll talk a little bit more about those, but basically in this context, we're talking about perforated surfaces um, that just have a physical structure where solids stay on that surface and the water passes through. And uh, the second is filters, where we use some sort of a medium uh, media column, sand, or some other um, material to separate the solid from the water. And then lastly, I want to talk probably the, the biggest emerging um, technology we have in the industry, which is the growth of membrane filtration, something technology has been around for decades, but something that sort of we've been excluded from with the volumes of water that we had until the last decade or so where we're starting to see a huge uh, increase in the use of that technology. So the first thing I'll talk about is screens. Uh, you'll see here at the top, one of the positive aspects of screens is that um, although we do have more advanced technology, I put my laser pointer on top of a static screen. These are available throughout uh, the U.S. And the beauty of these is, is for small processors, is they don't take uh, that, that maintenance expertise that we see in a lot of 
the equipment that we handle. This is, this is a screen that's completely static. Water and solids comes through the top of this static screen. It moves through a screen surface that you can see here where the solids will pass, uh, the solids will, will flow along the surface down to a holding container, the water will pass through the bottom of the screen and leave, and they're very effective, can move down into very small sizes, which we'll talk about here in just a minute. On the top of the screen on the other side, you'll see an example of an external rotary screen. Again, a little bit more advanced technology starting to involve things that are going to have to ha require regular preventative maintenance. But this is a screen where the water uh, passes through the outside of the screen. Solids come over the top. Those solids are collected. The wastewater passes through. We also uh, utilize what we call internal rotary screens, where the solids in the water pass through the inside of the screen. And those are probably uh, as popular as external rotary in the poultry processing industry. But screening we want to maximize as much as possible. Sand filters have been traditionally used at the tail end of processing systems uh, as sort of a polishing um, uh, step to kind of give us insurance that our wastewater is meeting all our permits um, before we exit our facilities. Um, and those screens, uh, sand filters here, again, trying to show examples that although these come in uh, very large, they're able to handle very large volumes, million, two million plus, volumes of water per day. There's also systems that are designed to handle in the few thousands uh, of gallons of wastewater per day. Now, not to leave it out, and I want to explore this idea of membrane filtration. Again, something of a technology has been around for many, many years, but not something we have used traditionally in wastewater, but we're seeing a big use of that now. When we talk about wastewater, if you look at this the, along the bottom here, I mentioned the fact, just to give you an idea of where we're at when we're talking about this size spectrum, that if we take a meter and divide it into a thousand units, we come up with, if we all remember the metric system from elementary school, you come up with what is commonly known as a micrometer, but today most of us refer to that simply as a micron. And it's and this is the uh, suffix you'll see, or the unit uh, that you'll see represented with the mu followed by the m. And that represents one thousandth of a millimeter, okay? Or if you will, one millionth, a thousand thousandths of a meter. And traditionally, if you look up here on this filtration spectrum, along this line at the top where I've got my pointer now, you'll see those, that micron range. So here, at a thousand micron, is basically the one millimeter particle size. And if we go down to about 500 micron, this is the line that we have traditionally dealt with in meat processing with the screen and technology we use. And it's easy to see, really easy to see, how much room there is from that point down that exists as we move into this idea of membrane filtration that we have the ability to use. And you look down this line, we go to particle filtration, which really works down to that one micron size, and then you start to see names that you might be familiar with when you see microfiltration or ultrafiltration, nanofiltration, and ultimately what we call the Cadillac of membrane filtration, reverse osmosis, something that has the ability to actually even remove metal ions. Again, technology that's been around for decades but when we're at large processing plants or meat processing plants, not a technology we've used um, over the years, but today we really are. As a quick example, the Wayne Farms uh, Pendergrass facility, which discharges well over a million gallons of um, processed water, wastewater every day from their plant in Pendergrass, Georgia, now has a million plus membrane filtration system operating in the ultra filtration range that polishes every gallon of water that leaves their facility. Just wouldn't have been available from a, from a financial standpoint a decade or two ago, but today makes sense for them to ensure that their water meets all their parameters. <clears throat> Again, large plants using these sort of systems, but I want to remind everyone what you're looking at here are skid-mounted systems. These systems literally fit on basically a pallet size that are available for small, medium-sized processors to use, one as test units, but also as operational units getting down into this membrane filtration size. These small systems are available.
The second step that we look at in treating our wastewater at a meat plant is the use of a chemical addition to enhance the physical separation process. If you're not familiar, this is where the technology, very popular technology of dissolved air flotation comes in. Dissolved air flotation is technically a physical separation process, but most places, uh, most facilities use chemicals to enhance this process and enable us to discharge our wastewater. And as I've noted in the box down here, for many of our pretreatment facilities, DAF effluent is op often acceptable for pretreatment discharge. It often we can usually tune that in with chemical addition to actually make it acceptable for discharge to POTW systems. The technology itself is, I've got one, a little bit of a busy diagram here, but on the surface, the best way to explain it is to talk about, well, a two liter Coke bottle, if you will. If any of you have opened a two liter Coke bottle uh, recently, you notice that when you release that pressure, um, the CO2 that's been injected into solution will actually, because of that reduction in pressure, come out of solution, form bubbles, and it gives you foam on the top of the surface. Well, that's exactly what we're doing in the dissolved air flotation system. This is wastewater, if we gave it the time that it needed, these solids most likely would actually, most of them would settle out over time, but we don't have time for that to happen in a quiescent environment like we have at a wastewater, large wastewater treatment plant. We've got to move along more quickly. So to do that, what we do is we enhance the process by releasing the pressure, micro bubbles form, and solids float to the top. We use chemicals to just enhance that process. Along the top, we skim off the solids, and we get cleaner water at the bottom. And most of the poultry industry, at least our large plants, all utilize dissolved air flotation, whether they're a pretreatment or full treatment system. And finally, if whether it's the POTW or our cells that take on this, this effort, the third step in the treatment process of meat processing wastewater is to use biological systems to physically consume the pollutants and stabilize those into uh, um, materials that we could use for different uh, things such as soil amendment or other uses. Basically, we divide our biological treatment into two basic categories. This idea of what we call anaerobic treatment, which is biological activity which takes place in the absence of free oxygen, or aerobic treatment, which is biological activity that takes place in the presence of free oxygen. Now, when we talk about anaerobic uh, treatment, we're talking about septic. We're talking, if you hear that word, it's analogous to anaerobic treatment. And the idea here is, and it's very common for people to, to say that it's done in the absence of oxygen, but you notice I specifically say the absence of free oxygen. All the bacteria that are going to operate within an anaerobic system are going to respirate um, using oxygen, but what we want are the bugs that are going to do that with chemically bound oxygen. It helps us in the treatment process. So just like the septic tank that might be in your yard, it operates in non-free oxygen conditions. And you see just a diagram here showing um, how that system works. If we look at the advantages and disadvantages of this system, um, if we look at the advantages, you can see them listed there. Anaerobic treatment has low biomass production. There's no free oxygen requirement, so we have very low energy costs. We're not using uh, blowers or different sorts of systems to inject oxygen like we see in an aerobic system. So we have a money savings there. We've got good pathogen control. And the main thing is that it gives us the ability to treat higher strength wastewater. We can take wastewater up around 2,500 milligrams per liter and actually use that to bring down our, as I say, bi uh, as an example, biochemical oxygen man, down to 250 milligrams per liter. And we also get good removal on our pollutants. The downside is, is over, uh, these systems tend to be very large. We need a large size because they're sensitive. We have sort of an unstable environment we, uh, that includes some harmful byproducts. We tend to deal with that, again, with large volumes. But we also have, as a discharge, methane, a flammable gas. So that is a concern. Um, sometimes we need a need for additional, uh, well, we will need additional organics treatment. Once we go through anaerobic treatment, we will need aer uh, aerobic treatment to finish the job, if you will. 
And it's also not a system that removes nitrogen. Actually, it will convert a lot of nitrogen, but it does not remove nitrogen from the system. Brian, I'm going to give you just a few more minutes. Okay. Um, anaerobic systems uh, are also able to come in very small. Uh, these units, uh, they tend to be large in a lot of our plants, but UASB is a technology that really drops the footprint. Finally, the last thing we'll talk about is aerobic treatment. This is the traditional treatment that most municipal wastewater systems use. You can see the advantages and disadvantages there of those systems listed here. They can be very large and cover a lot of surface area like you see at, uh, at uh, privately owned, uh, I mean publicly owned treatment works or POTWs. But again, I'm putting my uh, highlighter on a system that we use at restaurant level uh, even for doing anaerobic treatment. Those small systems are available and they can work on a very small scale. The last thing that's typically required if we do direct discharge uh, using aerobic treatment and some sort of disinfection. Um, but other than that, that covers what I need to today and hope I can answer any questions that you have. Oh, great, thank you so much. Um, I don't see any questions coming in immediately, so we'll we'll save them for the end if folks have more questions on wastewater. But I think this is really helpful. I mean, figuring out wastewater treatment for meat processing is um, one of the first steps somebody should look at when they're building a new plant. So we're also going to talk about solid waste, and, and Jean is going to help us here. Let me pass the slides over to you, Jean. Hold on one second. So Jean Bonatel has worked at the Cornell Waste Management Institute in solid waste education for over 20 years. Jean's work includes food scrap, manure, and carcass and butcher waste composting education and research. And previously, she has worked with the National Park Service, the Forest Service, EPA, and the landscape and greenhouse industry. And Jean, I believe you have control of the slides, so we'll let you get started. There we go. Can you see the same slides? Yep. No? Okay, great. Okay. Um, so. Butcher waste management in general. Um, I am going to talk a lot about composting, but how that plays into everything. Um, okay. There. Um, some of the situation, there's a lack of services. Um, we don't have renderers that are picking up waste that as they used to. Um, and there are a lot of reasons for that. Um, but basically, the market ha for their products has gotten smaller. So they just don't need as much. Um, they can't find the markets for as much material. So there's a lack of services in many areas. Um, but renderers are still out there. They are still picking up material. It just depends on who you are and what they ha what what they need from you. Um, there are different parts that are not accepted in the rendering industry. So all the prion diseases. Um, at this point, we have specified risk materials. So those specified risk materials need to come out of the animal, and that's brain, brain stem, tongue, um, parts of the lymph nodes in the lymph system of the animals before they could go uh, and be rendered. Um, cost. Uh, the cost has changed pretty drastically. So we used to be paid for rendered materials that could be rendered and now we're paying to dispose of them. Um, so that there is a big cost difference at this point and everybody just doesn't have access. So we'll talk a little bit about um, where we can go from here. Um, the cost, you know, industry cost is expensive, uh, $20 per barrel um, of residuals and generally Cattle yield about 40% uh, in retail cut. The processing of uh, a 1,200-pound steer, you're going to have, you know, quite a lot of residuals still. Um, they produce one and a half to two barrels of residuals, and that can be 30 to 40 dollars in disposal, depending on where you are. Now, this is going to be different in different parts of the country. So, these were calculated for New York at this point. Um, and so it's going to differ in different places. Um, with the 400 butchers, they're each processing about 600 beef cattle. Um, it's expensive, so we have quite a bit 
quite a bit, eighteen to twenty four hundred dollars, twenty four thousand dollars in expenses there. Um, can it be kept passed on to the consumer? Maybe, maybe not. Um, if our prices go up too much, then uh, we have problems with that as well. There are endless applications for uh, composting and looking at these materials. I'm not going to talk as much about solid waste, um, but I will talk about boxes and things like that, box board and things like that. But um, most of our waste is what we would consider organic waste, something that um, could be composted. Um, Roadkill, fish and seafood residuals, meat recalls, Butcher waste, of course, um, mass casualty, we work on that. Um, beached animals, farm mortality, and, you know, the more practice people have, the easier it is to understand what they're doing and to do that effectively. Um, as I said, you know, when we have an animal that we suspect has prion diseases that comes into the, into the butcher operation, we basically need to... Um, report that, and then they can check, make sure what the problem is, and either the animal would be kept at that point or the animal would have to be destroyed and it would be taken care of because we don't want prion diseases to be getting into um, rendering and other things. So when we're looking for a, compost, a site to uh, compost, we need a well-drained site. Um, at least 200 feet from water courses, and we have to think about where wash water is, where human consumption water, and where the animal's water might be. Um, we also want to look for um, areas that might be hydrologically sensitive, so there might be cattails and other um, water-loving plants, willows, things like that. Um, you're going to create a compost bed. Some of the composting is done right on the soil surface. Um, it is legal to compost in most states. Uh, California does not allow the composting of mammalian flesh at this point, but they do allow poultry to be composted. Um, but you, there are various surfaces, and this is just uh, one surface that I'm looking at that we're looking at here is just a, um, a vegetated field. So we maintain those fields, we vegetate those, we mow in between the windrows, um, and we put down a nice bed of carbon there. Um, so the bed of carbon is really important. That's something that is going to make the composting process work and I'll talk about that more. This one I see, I looked at it just a minute ago and I saw that it got a little bit messed up, but it's looking at compost pad surfaces. Um, the top one here, uh, the top left, is um, just a, a cement block bin, Jersey barriers, cement block, they're the waste concrete generally. And that one was used there and they have cement below and then they have a gravel surface. They also have um, an area where um, this was first when it was the 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 um, plant was in, the cement was installed. So there's no grass growing there, but they also have a vegetated buffer strip, and you can see that down in the one below it. They're starting to vegetate below that, and that helps to absorb anything that may run off, including rain, because any rain that hits that is going to run off. We really shouldn't have very much leachate from um, butcher waste compost. We'll work toward making sure that that doesn't happen. Um, the one in the in the right hand on the right hand side is a, a surface that's cloth and gravel, and that's not a pond in the in the post ground there. It's actually leachate collection, and it mostly collects rainwater that come off the hill and are directed into that so that they don't cause any pollution. Um, but it's not, there's not very much leachate that is actually used to uh, water fields to, to... Okay. Um, some facilities want to have a covered bin. And some rules, some states prefer that we have covered bins over others. It really doesn't matter. Um, the covered 
the cover may help retain some moisture in the pile so that they don't dry out in the sun, but it really isn't that big a deal. It really, I would, I would prefer to see it done without roof because very little water goes into those piles, so very little is going to be running off. When they're actively composting, the water isn't going to matter. The rainwater and, and snow melt isn't going to matter on those piles. So I do like to have, um, I do like to compost without roofs. Another bin system, and they have front slats on this one. Uh, these can be done differently. I like a multi-bin system if you're going to use bins. I do like the multi-bin system because you fill up the first bin and everything is composting, and we're going to make sure that we lay it out so that everything is passively composting. We don't need to turn the pro turn in this process. But once we fill those up, then we may fill up the second one, and then we may turn the first one a couple months later. We may be turning the first one into the third bin or into a bin outside. So um, we, don't process, we don't turn early in the process of composting mortality and butcher waste, but uh, we can turn later when all the parts are um, degraded and, and not recognizable. Important, really, really important. This coarse material that's down on the ground here in this picture, it's 24 inches of very coarse material. We need that coarse, woody material to, number one, absorb some of the moisture that might be coming from the butcher waste um, and to allow air into those piles. So if we have dense manure or dense just soil on the base, no air is going to be able to circulate into that pile. So it really is important. Once we put the butcher waste into that pocket that we've made there, then and then we cover that over, that material is going to, going to heat up very quickly. And when it heats up, that's going to, the heat's going to rise in that pile naturally, and it's going to, the, the air is going to need to be pulled in from the base of that pile. Just different ways that we're conveying material to the compost piles. This happened to be a sunset picture. Um, but bringing that material out in buckets or in a, in a loader bucket or in physical buckets or containers as a way to convey that material out to the compost pile, get it onto the carbon. Um, here's another conveyor. They retrofitted this um, trailer so that they could bring their butcher waste out without dripping all down the road that they were traveling on. That's really important. We can't, when we're moving it from place to place, we can't be doing that. And you may not be composting right next to the, the butcher operation, but you may. Uh, we do have people that compost pretty close to their operation, and they have customers in and out all the time. Uh, it can be done well and without odor, so um, that's something that needs to be looked at. Signage is pretty important, um, especially if different people are bringing material out to the compost pile. We don't want people digging, in, digging into these piles before their time, and we don't want uh, people to be just dumping material on the ground and in different areas, so we want to have some signage to say, put compost compostable materials here and such. So, um, with, butcher, with butcher waste uh, residuals, we really want to make sure that we're using a coarse carbon material on the base. So we see that coarse carbon material there, then we're going to um, put a layer, of media, a layer of meat, offal, blood, other materials in that layer and then another layer of carbon that can be a little bit more dense, but, but uh, not too dense, something like um, haylage, silage, other materials that, you know, maybe waste materials from someplace. Leaves could go in there. Uh, then another layer of material. And people say, well, how thick can we have those layers of material? Well, if it starts flowing off the pile, it's going to be too thick at that point. So it needs to be able to set up on, in that layer. And then we can put another layer on top of that. That biofilter keeps the odor, filters the odor as it comes out of the pile, 
and we don't have odors that are going to be bringing in wildlife and um, house pets are usually the biggest problem because they can smell the stuff, they're not afraid of us, so they'll come into a pile and uh, investigate. When that pile is hot, most animals will not dig into it. And the pile is going to heat up very quickly. You're going to see, especially with butcher waste, we see even higher temperatures in the compost pile, up to 170 degrees Fahrenheit. Again, pick your carbon. Make sure that the carbon is good. And this is going to be a kind of a... a um, a recap. The other thing I said that I would talk a little bit about is uh, cardboard boxes that may be waste products for you. If they are chipped, if you have a way to break down that cardboard, the wax corrugated and the uh, regular cardboard can go into that compost pile. It adds more carbon. Um, most of the time we do have um, recycling programs for the regular cardboard, but the wax car corrugated we generally don't. So pick your carbon, make sure you have good stuff. Uh the the carbon on the on the right is simply um municipal wood chips. And that really does a good job for composting. Um this is in uh, an operation in British Columbia. The reason that we have plastic underneath it is because we were doing research to collect all the leachate that was on that came out of those piles and we didn't have any leachate to test because the composting process was done properly. So most of that moisture ends up going off as steam in the compost process. So laying your base down, that looks like an exaggerated base, um, but laying a good base of carbon down. Then um, I have a cow in here and I have this in here because sometimes we end up with a whole animal that we have to put in a pile. This happened to be in the winter. As you can see, there's snow mixed in. We still want to incorporate those into the pile, even in the cold weather. And it, especially when we've incorporated it into a hot pile, that hot pile is going to ripple down. The, the heat's going to ripple down that pile and help heat that um, that animal up and allow the microbes to work in those colder conditions. Then the microbes will take over and they'll do the work and um, produce the heat in that pile. They're putting a couple layers on. Now this equipment is kind of overkill, but people use the equipment that they have. Um, and this happened to be a situation where they were hauling butcher waste over the Rockies. And it was costing a lot and it was problematic in general. So. Um, and uh, then another, so after that layer, then another layer of of material. And then we pretty much walk away from those piles. We want to make sure that there's no uh, feet and no animal parts sticking out because that's what is going to attract the animals. That should never, if blood is dropped on the, on the ground, we really need to scoop that up and get it into the pile. Uh, we don't want these kinds of situations. So I explained how um, these are just a quick one to ha how silage is made versus how compost is made. When we're making silage, we're compressing all the air out of that silage, so all the oxygen is out. When we're making compost, we're trying to get air into that pile, and thus we need those large, the, the chunky wood chips. And that's what it looked like in the uh, final. Uh, we may want to have a berm if we have any water running off the piles at all. We may want to have a berm so that it's pr it protects the water. It actually filters the water as, as it's going through. As Brian sort of mentioned earlier, we want to filter anything that would, before it goes into a, a water system. Um, the time it takes. A well-stacked pile will heat up in 12 to 24 hours, usually before I leave a site. We're building piles, and before I leave the site, we've got heat in those piles. Uh, first month with a full-size cow, it's going to look like cooked meat. Uh, second month, the meat is being digested by the microbes. And in the third month, we have clean bones. Uh, mature compost in six to nine months. Even if we have frozen frozen parts, pieces, we may want to get those into piles. And then when the air temperature comes up, those temperatures will come up and uh, we'll have composting taking place. Um, process takes four to six months for a finished product, sometimes a little bit longer. But 
um, poultry can be processed in as little as uh, 24 days or so. They are pretty quick, but we still have active compost at that point. We just don't recognize any of the parts that we put in there. Uh, fish as well, some of the larger animals take a little bit longer. Immature animals are, are quite fast because their bones have not cal calcified. So when we have immature animals, they, they um, compost pretty quickly. Um, turn only if desired after three months, and then reuse some of that carbon and the bones as the next base for your process. The bones will be there. Make sure you're securing plenty of carbon. Reuse, reuse the carbon source, as I said, the bones add more structure. So just use those in the base and use new material in the, on the top as the cover, as the biofilter. Um, size of the pile. I have a pile in here, pictured in here. We don't want that. That's a huge amorphous pile. We really want nice windrows or independent piles. Um, when we're doing this. And we're, if we're composting a lot of material, we really do want a windrow. And that's like a long table um, that's 8 foot tall by 10 to 12 feet wide by as long as you have space for it. Um, there are different regulations in different areas, but as I said, for the most part, butcher waste is compostable in most states. But do check. Um, sometimes we're making a mess when we're doing this or learning to do this, and then the regulators will get involved and say, we really need to do a better job. So, um, And sometimes it's simply getting training from, from your extension people, um, having them do a workshop so that people understand what's happening. Poor coverage is, is one of the worst things that we can do. We want to make sure that we have plenty of carbon over those because that is the biofilter. Then we won't have odor problems and we don't, won't have um, animals digging into the, the piles. Odor is in the nose of the beholder. Remember, we may be smelling some of these smells all the time, dead meat, dead, dead animals, um, and we probably need to have somebody else check to make sure that we're not getting odors out of our piles. And that's where I will end. Uh, my contact information, if you need any more information, is here. And we have many fact sheets on how this is done, videos on how it's done. And they're all available for free um, on our website. So feel free to um, look us up. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jean. And I, I will just echo what a wealth of resources your website is. I send people there all the time. So there's really a lot of information if you're interested in, in digging deeper on this topic. Um, we have we can go over our time here, so we have some more time for questions if, if folks have a few. I have one that came in here. Um, Jean, could you share some approximations on the ratio between your carbon filtration mass or volume to organic waste? So how much carbon material relative to butcher waste? Um, it, it's a little bit hard, you know. We have, we've got some um, basic rules. What we really want underneath is that 24 inches. Then we, mm -hmm. can, we can put the material down, then we're going to put other material. But if you want to calculate what you have, if you can use your, we have a tension, tissue density um, program that you can actually put the numbers in and say, I have, you know, a thousand pounds a week of this material and put that in and that will bring up the bring up the the pounds that you need for your operation. So we the it, carbon. we mm -hmm. Yeah. We mm -hmm. really want you it's it's gonna be um, you know, one bucket of if we're looking at bucket wise we're going to want one bucket of of butcher waste to three buckets of carbon. Okay. Okay, that's good to know. Yep. And that tissue density calculator, I'm assuming, is on your website. Um, yeah, there's reference to it on our website. Mm -hmm. Yes, and it's mm -hmm. uh, Michigan State has that tissue density um, tool. Oh, good. Good. Um, other questions, I'll, I'll give folks a few minutes to type them in. Um, you know, this is something that we 
I hear from a lot of people that are interested in building new meat processing facilities. And pretty much as soon as we go, after we cover the economics of it, are the, is there enough demand? Do they have enough animals to process to cover their operating costs? Um, and we're getting into construction and building, really waste management is the first thing I focus on because setting up your wastewater treatment when you're going to connect to municipal or you're going to set up your own system, um, you know, those can be pretty significant costs and they're ongoing costs for managing that waste. And, and the same with solid waste. I mean, are you, do you have contact with the renderer? Are you on somebody's route? Um, are you able to compost in your region? So these, these things are important to think about for building new plants in terms of location. It can really, really impact where you site a facility. Um, and there's a lot of other things that go into siting a facility, but waste is a, is a key, a key factor. Um, any other questions or, or uh, Tommy or Brian, did things come up during the other presentations that you wanted to comment on? I'll just throw out one and that is, and it goes back to the point you just made, uh, Catherine, and that is that in many states, um, when we start to talk about these these wastewater treatment systems, um, and I, of course can't speak for every state, but George is an example that you're going to be you're going to be in, required to engage a professional engineer um, that is going to apply his stamp to whatever system is ultimately approved. I I know in Georgia that we've had some incidents in the past where we got to really small systems and we were able to here at the University of Georgia um, apply just very simple technologies that didn't meet that criteria but with and the, but these were those tend to be sort of grandfathered in systems that had been around for many years and we and that we worked with but most of our new construction um, and these new systems in many places and Tommy you could might comment and to that is is are going to require a professional engineer get involved that would that but but there's there's some positive aspects to that because they're familiar with the technology, they're familiar with a lot of things that can help you along the way. Um, but that can be a little scary at times. The idea that you're going to have to engage a, a PE uh, immediately to try to get one of these systems designed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I guess you know we we're trying to serve as many um, interested parties through this type of educational event. But you know. Mm -hmm. We still see very small processing plants. Maybe they're game and custom mm -hmm. exempt only, and they've got two different dumpsters and uh, two septic tanks in sequence, just large residential septic tanks in sequence, and that's all they need. And they have the go-ahead from the county, county sanitarian, right? But then as we start to move up in scale, you know, we're going to see things get more complex. And like Brian said, there's a lot of... Um, sort of package size um, opportunities on the technology end that have come down from bigger industrial systems that now might fit our mid-sector meat processing plants. Um, and then there's, there's just going to be, it's a wide spectrum. There's going to be a lot in between. Um, we didn't really get into detail today about um, land application as an alternative to um, sending to the POTW or cleaning up enough for direct discharge to say a creek or something. Um, and that's where you have a moderately treated wastewater and you irrigate it to um, crops or forage. Um, and and that's, the, that's the end of it. So that's, that's a whole other topic and it might fit mm -hmm. certain situations. Um, mm -hmm. That vegetated so. uh, filter strip that I was talking about with the compost mm -hmm. pads, Tommy, is, is you know, leading to that. And there is a standard for that uh, with NRCS. It's the same standard as a silage um, bay would be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I I would offer one more comment that um, blood is a tough one, and we do have a composting fact sheet for liquids, and blood is in there. We realize that sometimes blood's a liquid, sometimes it's a solid. It coagulates, so it's a funny material to work with. But um, we can compost and do compost. Um, blood, it's really hard to discharge that to land anymore because just the amount of nitrogen and the potential for pollution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a pretty high strength uh, waste stream. Yeah. Well, if we don't have and, any more questions, mm -hmm. oh, go ahead, Jean. And, and work with your municipalities to get uh, wood chips or uh, chunky waste because they all have, um, you know, chipped wood around and that's a good source. Yeah, yeah, that's a waste stream they're looking to get rid of too. Um, 
Well, if we don't have any more questions, I don't see any coming in, I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up. I'm typing in our website address there into the box. Um, our webinars are posted on our website and they go out um, to our listserv as well. So if you're not on our listserv, please join. You can do that from the website. And I want to thank our speakers. This has been incredibly informative and a really good overview of, of the basics for folks. And, and thank you to our audience for attending. Um, and have a great rest of the day. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you.